So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I think it's a really exciting group to be presenting in front of because, you know, it's, it's you guys that we do this work for and it's, it's you know, it's, it's a privilege to meet you all. Um, so as Karen said, I'm a PhD student in haematology, so my interest is paediatric thrombosis, so looking at blood clots in, in children and preventing blood clots in children. And my PhD is actually looking at the, the cross-sectional study that's been mentioned a few times today. And in particular, um, I'm looking at to see if aspirin or warfarin is better at preventing blood clots. And as secondary outcomes to that, we're also looking at bone health, so whether or not um, it, it, it impacts on bones or a quality of life as well. So we'll be speaking a little bit about that today. So this is an outline of what I'll be talking about today. So firstly, and I think very importantly, why anticoagulation is important in Fontan patients. And if you've been prescribed anticoagulation, why, why you need to be taking it. Secondly is about bone development in children. And lastly, any recommendations about um, patients receiving long-term warfarin and, and what we can do. So firstly, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but you are at an increased risk of having a blood clot compared to the general population. And that's for a number of reasons, but the main reasons are because your heart looks different to somebody else's heart, and that's because you've got uh, surgical sites, you've got um, areas where blood can pool and collect, you've also got uh, foreign material that can trigger an inflammation response. And so what we do is we usually recommend that Fontan patients have anticoagulation, and that might be with aspirin, it might be with warfarin, it might be with something else. So what we know is that death from embolism is 25% in paediatric patients and 38% in adult patients. So that's striking numbers and a really good reason why you should be anticoagulated. But we also know that patients who are on well-controlled warfarin or aspirin are three and a half times less likely to develop a thrombus. And these are the things we're trying to prevent here. So we're trying to prevent pulmonary embolism, which can lead to Fontan failure and stroke. We want to prevent collateral, collateral development, which can, implica uh, which can complicate future chest surgeries and transplantation. We want to stop the reoccurrence of thrombosis. So if you've had one, you're more likely to have another one, another important reason that you need to be taking anticoagulation. Long-term disability and, of course, death. So now for a bit of a change of topic, but the importance of optimal bone development in children. So we know in the general population, so everybody, uh, that there's rising rates of osteoporosis. And osteoporosis has high morbidity, mortality and, and cost to, to society and obviously to us as individuals. And we have this thing that we refer to as peak bone mass. And this is really a really important concept to understand. And that's that there is a specific period of childhood and adolescence that we, and, early, and in your early 20s as well, that we accumulate bone mass. And so that's uh, how much bone you have. And the way I like to think about this is, is about like depositing money into a bank. So you want to make sure you've got enough money in the bank so when you head into retirement, you, you, know, you don't end up bankrupt. So if we can get our, our peak bone mass as high as possible, then when we have the inevitable decline, which we all have, um, we've got <coughs> enough stores in there to, to get us through. So warfarin. Now, I'm sure all of you know by now that warfarin is a vitamin K inhibitor and it prevents the production of certain proteins clotting proteins that are vitamin K dependent. So osteocalcinin is a vitamin K dependent protein and it's really important in bone building. And because warfarin is a vitamin K inhibitor and osteocalcin is vitamin K dependent, there, there is an interaction between them. So this brings me to my study. So we've done a preliminary analysis of some of the data that we have on 66 patients. So this study for anyone who doesn't know, and I think a lot of you here have actually participated, um, is a multi-centred study, so we've done it in Melbourne, Sydney and in Auckland, and we're, we're comparing bone mineral density on a DEXA scanner uh, between patients receiving aspirin and those receiving warfarin. And what we did find already, so this is only on 66 out of approximately um, 100 to 150 patients, uh, that there is a significant decrease in bone mineral density in patients receiving warfarin. And now, this was not particularly surprising considering what, what I had said earlier. However, this is the first time that it's actually been shown in quite a, um, a homogenous group, so quite a comparable group of individuals, taking only, you know, the only difference being two medications. So what do we do with this information? So we know we need to take warfarin, but we also know that warfarin can, uh, can affect your bone development, and that's really concerning, especially for parents with children who are young and that are going to be on long-term warfarin. 
Well, these are the recommendations from our uh, endocrinology department at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And this is obviously general advice um, that needs to be considered with your uh, medical team. But usually we recommend that from five years of age, your child gets a, uh, an initial DEXA scan. So that's the same type of scan that I was talking about earlier. And it has very low radiation and it's very non-invasive. And so if you return a normal bone mineral density, then we usually don't worry about it for another three to four years. So we will repeat that scan then. If you do come back with a low bone mineral density, then again, it's, we don't do too much. It's usually just looking at it again in two years' time. What we're mainly concerned with is not the absolute number. We're looking for a decrease in um, the number of bone mineral density and, or an increase. So if, if you're looking like you've had a massive drop, that might be a reason to start investigating, you know, is there something else going on with this patient? And what can we actually do to improve it then? If we know that this is a problem, what can we, how can we improve it? So there's some really simple things that you can do. So the first is two to three servings of dairy. Usually pretty easy in young kids, and if not, then you should supplement with calcium. The second one is vitamin D supplementation. We really recommend that across the board, uh, at least throughout winter, and that's often a recommendation for, for most people, not, not just those on warfarin. And that's because a sun prescription is very difficult. So that depends on where you live, how often you're outside, are you wearing covered clothes, um, what your skin colour is. So that's why we say across the board, vitamin D supplementation is a really good thing. The next one is exercise, and I have to stress as appropriate, but weight bearing is best. So that might include things like brisk walking, jogging, skipping, tennis, dancing, or stair walking. So this is exercise done on your feet where you bear your own weight. And then lastly, it might sound like a strange one, but ensure that puberty is reached at an appropriate age. So if you recall the, uh, the, the figure before where we showed that, um, that increase of bone, um, bone mineral density across age, puberty is a really cu crucial time for that to start occurring. So you know, if you are concerned that your child is not reaching puberty at the appropriate time, you need to speak to your, um, your doctor and get referred to a paediatric endocrinologist. Um, and so what considerations do we have? What are we actually concerned about? We're mainly concerned about fractures. So that's what this all comes down to is, does, will my child have osteoporosis? Are they, are they getting fractures? So to put it in into perspective, one in three children will fracture. So that's just across the board. It's a pretty normal thing. You know, kids are usually very gutsy and will, will play um, you know, roughly. So it's very normal. But what we're concerned about is, has this child had multiple fractures? How did they get the fracture? You know, were they, they fall off at quite a height, then that's probably reasonable to expect that they've had a fracture. But if they just sort of fell awkwardly and broke a hip, then we'd be concerned about that. Um, do we know that they've got low bone mineral density? Do they have spinal fractures? And often they won't come up um, unless you've had a de DEXA. The only treatment we have for children at the moment with low bone mineral density is bisphosphonate treatment. So there are other options in adults, but in children, this is our only one. And the only time it's ever indicated is where there are fractures present and confirmed low bone, bone mineral density. So to conclude, what we do know is that anticoagulation is effective and appropriate at preventing blood clots in, in Fontan patients. We know that long-term warfarin may affect bone development in children. And there are recommendations and there are th simple things that we can do to improve the outcomes of, of these children. So I'd like to acknowledge, in particular, Dr. Peter Sim from the RCH Endocrinology Department, who um, actually you know, gave me these recommendations. We had a, a really good chat about what we could do. Uh, the Fontan Registry team, of course, and my supervisors. So thank you very much. <laughs>